Marshall, good afternoon. I want to invite you for this 15 minutes to think big. So, and by big, I really mean the whole Earth. We've had satellites up for decades. Satellites are not new. What's interesting that's going on right now is a, a virtual explosion in our availability to launch them. Um, a multiple order of magnitude decrease in their cost, and a commensurate increase in the availability of the imagery. So we see a day within three to five years where we'll be able to get imagery of every city that we care about in the world every day. And, not, and that imagery will not be limited to governments and, and other folks who can pay vast amounts of money, but will be available for any kind of strategic application as applied to retail or, or other verticals. So we've already got the ability to take 8 million square kilometers of daily imagery, which is basically the size of the United States every day, but spread around the world. That's now going up by a factor of 10, and as drones start to fly, by another factor of 10. And this is all brought to you as virtual reality. The, guy, the virtual reality you talked earlier said, by the cell phone. Because the new, the new satellite companies are basically taking cell phones putting a bit, big, bit, bit better lens on the front, putting solar panels on the top, and launching them into space, which you can see they're on the extreme left. So the interesting question that that brings up is, who's going to look at all those pictures? So if you now have pictures of every square kilometer of every city in the world every day, there's just not enough people to look at all the images. It's, it's vastly too much data, um, just like we see today in other fields. Um, fortunately for us, there's this thing called deep learning, which also powers the, the uh, motion analysis discussed in the previous talk. But we use deep learning in AI in a bit different way. We use it to scale up our ability to look at images. So Orbital Insight and a number of other companies in our space, we don't actually own any satellites. Uh, the only hardware we own is laptops. Uh, we run everything in the Amazon cloud, but what we run there is very serious AI. And that AI allows us to count cars, to count chlorophyll atoms, to count trees, to see how close trees are to houses, to see where new houses are being built, to count trucks, and in general, to understand the world. So when we actually deliver data streams out the end of the pipeline, we're not delivering images. In fact, our, our contracts with the satellite providers don't even let us share the images. The only thing we share is the data that comes out. And that data may say, oh, Walmart's going to have a great quarter. Um, it may say there's deforestation going on in the Amazon, and here's the amount. It may say the following new cities are being built in China. Uh, it may say here are the parts of the world that are now developing to the point where they're interesting from, a, from an international retail point of view. In general, allows us to track um, geospatial, geoeconomic trends uh, on a worldwide basis. So to make that a little bit more focused, let's look at what we've, what some of the work we've done so far in retail. Um, one of the most visible things, especially in the US, where basically everybody goes everywhere by car, um, one of the easiest things, at least conceptually, to get your mind around is the idea of counting cars. Now, we count cars using neural networks. So the, so the input image is like this image in the upper right. It's a fairly low resolution satellite image. Um, but you can still see the shape of the cars, and the algorithm is then able to detect the cars. Um, we have on an individual image, we still have some error, although these, these cars, some of the dark cars, people even disagree about how many there are, but we may have a few percent error on the image. But then when we process a million images, which we can run um, over just a few hours now in a modern compute cloud, um, we can get a very accurate, emergent, large-scale picture of trends. So one of the ways to look at that trend, look at those trends that's immediately relevant, is where do people actually park? Um, there's a general belief that folks park near the entrance doors, and this is in a Walmart in the US. General belief, people park near the entrance doors, and the other retailers that are located near the Walmart don't get very much business. And we actually see this. This is six years of imagery boiled down into one heat map, where red means we very often see cars in that spot, and blue means we almost never see cars in that spot. Um, we can also look at this a long time in a single chain. So this is a, a retailer in the US looking over 2010. We've got six years of data on about, on about 50 retailers, and we're going to do another 50 later this year. Um, many retailers, as I'm sure you guys are, would not be at all surprised to hear, have very strong seasonal patterns. Um, we see in the US an uptick right before Thanksgiving, um, a small down at Thanksgiving, a huge increase around December, and then January is abysmal. 
Um, so one of the interesting things that we saw almost globally, even the retailers that didn't do much more business in December, they still all get killed in January. The other thing we can see is we can take, since we have six years of data, we can look at individual weekly patterns. So if you look at a retailer like Kohl's here, it turns out they have obviously Saturday's their biggest day. That's not a big surprise. But Wednesday's are their second or their third biggest day of the week. And at first we thought this was a bug in the software because why the heck should there be a, a secondary peak on Wednesdays for this retailer? It turns out they have a senior discount day on Wednesday. And so all the, all the senior citizens get 10% off. They don't care when they shop, so they all shop on Wednesdays. We looked at Ross. Ross has a senior discount day on Tuesday. This tells us two important things. The most important thing from our point of view is that it tells us that our code's actually working, that when we say we're counting Ross stores in this image and Kohl's cars in this image, we're actually getting the chain we think we're getting. And it also tells us that these sales are actually having an, an impact that we can directly measure. We can also do pairs comparisons, which is interesting because it lets us actually see trends over time and see whether or not that, uh, there's an advance being made on one, on one store versus another. This is Lowe's versus Home Depot in the US um, over a period of five years. Um, the interesting thing to notice, well, first, the obvious thing to notice is that Home Depot is winning. And this has been very strongly reflected in their stock price over this period of time. We were able to predict some um, very good quarters for Home Depot, where their stock went up quite a lot, which made some of our uh, Wall Street customers very happy. Um, but we can also see at a more fine-grained level how this happened. And the way it happened was way back in 2010, Home Depot started pulling away in the spring, which is a really critical quadrant for, for a home improvement store, because that's when people are doing their major projects. That's when they're really shopping and doing new things. And then over time, year by year, we see that advantage in the spring spread over more and more of the year until now they dominate. Um, all year. We can also look at a macro level. A lot of these big data projects like ours will have some error on a store level, they'll have less error on a chain level, but the least error of all is when we look on a macro level. So we've been tracking in the US how much, um, what the retail macro number is going to be. This is a very important number, not only because it, it's an indicator of consumer confidence, but the Federal Reserve watches it closely. Um, and, and a lot of investors gain or lose a lot of money in a day every month when this number comes out. So we've now been able to aggregate the 50 chains together and get a better prediction of retail macro than uh, the consensus on Wall Street, which I still find very amusing that we've got a bunch of geeks in Palo Alto who can actually forecast retail macro better than the guys on Wall Street who've done this for their entire career. Um, and it's all because of the ability of what we can do with deep learning and with the volume of satellite imagery um, that we have available today. Um, the other thing we can see is we can look at regional effects. So the, in, this, in this graph, we've taken all the data and we've cut it, instead of cutting it by chain, we've actually cut it by region. So we've put the black is the northeast of the US um, and the red is the rest of the country. Now the last couple winters, there's been this polar vortex, which has brought a lot of very cold air down into the northeast of the US. And there have been people that go, well, talking heads get up on, on CN, CNBC and they say, well, retail sales are down, but that's okay because they're just down because it's really bad weather and they'll come back in the spring, so don't worry about it. And other people say, well, retail sales are down and it's because the economy is falling apart and the world's going to end. Um, and what we can actually show here is that actually, in this case, the optimists are right. So, so in the years like 2014, which is circled, where there was a really bad winter, we see a huge decrease in January, February, but then we see a commensurate increase in the spring. So basically, as soon as the snow melts, everybody goes shopping again. Um, and, and in the other years, like 2011, 2010, winter wasn't too bad. The Northeast and the rest of the country stayed pretty much together all winter. And in the spring, they continued to stay together. Um, so some of that traffic, I'm sure, it goes to online, but a fair amount of that traffic really was just waiting for the snow to melt um, over the last couple of years. Um, as we go into the future, one of the really interesting technologies on the horizon is drones. So we've started looking at when we can get down not only just, and the imagery we look at mostly is in the 50 centimeters per pixel range. So each, each pixel is conveniently about the size of this magazine here. That's about one pixel for us in most of our applications. But with drone imagery, we can get a much higher resolution image. And we can actually look at a parking lot like this. And this parking lot is shared by a Home Depot, a Sports Authority, and a Nordstrom's. And we had some poor intern 
um, undergraduate intern who actually went through and watched hours of video and put a little dot on each car based on where, which store that person went into. Um, and this helps us um, fine tune the parking lot masks we use to count cars for each of the stores. But it also shows something again about customer behavior. People really are lazy. They really go, they really do park next to the closest, really park very close to the store they're going to go to. Um, but we can also automate the, we can also run the video in, in, in fast motion. Um, so there's a lot in this. So I'm going to put it on loop so you can actually see it go through a few times. So the obvious thing to notice is, is the teenager there driving diagonally across the parking lot, right? It's got to be a teenager, right, without even knowing. Um, the other thing to notice is that we can actually see the people. So one of our engineers actually built change detection software. So it's highlighting in red there anything that's moving, anything that's changing. So you can actually see the people walking out of the store in ones and by twos. Um, you can see them walking out with or without shopping carts. Um, you can actually see this, this guy over here who actually unloads his, brings up his shopping cart, unloads it into his truck, and then moves his shopping cart under a tree. And the last thing, um, actually when it, when it starts again, you'll be able to see this. There's actually a dotted line that starts from the top and comes dotting down there. That's actually a bird. So, um, the bird's moving a lot faster than the cars, so, so we actually end up just with a dotted line. Um, so we can track bird behavior as well as customer behavior. So I think, I think this is sort of the future of what we can do. So this is, by the way, was um, a summary. This is a fast version of about 30 minutes of video um, shot at 400 feet um, with, a, with a stand, what is now a standard commercial drone. Um, and this is the kind of behavioral analysis that will be possible in the future for retail shopping behavior as well as in ports in um, downtown areas and, and in other kinds of applications. So lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the applications we see coming here. Um, so beyond helping guys on Wall Street figure out which of your companies to invest in. Um, so let me talk about a few of them. So one thing that, that is really interesting is understanding store performance and contextualizing store performance. So if you know that your store in Manchester is not doing as well as your store in Liverpool, why is that? There's a couple possibilities. Maybe you've got a, a manager that doesn't know what they're doing. Maybe the, um, the store is not, the, the employees are not as happy there. Maybe they have bad customer service. Or maybe it's just that the overall shopping environment has gotten worse and you shouldn't fire your manager because the whole economy in that microclimate has gone down. So we can contextualize the behavior of individual stores by giving the general trends and car counts and customer behavior in say a kilometer radius around stores to contextualize what you're seeing on a store by store basis. We can also understand what's going on with the customer behavior. Um, by looking, especially if you start flying drones and seeing, are people going in? Are they immediately walking out? Are they bringing shopping carts? Are they having trouble getting in because there's too much traffic and they can't get to the store? Um, the, uh, one of the obvious applications is store locations. Um, by understanding traffic patterns, by understanding where traffic jams are, where it's easy to get in and get out. Um, as well as, when you think about optimizing store locations, you shouldn't think about that just in terms of within a city, but within a country. So understanding what countries, especially in emerging markets, where cities and regions and towns and emerging markets are starting to reach the point where they need a grocery store or where they need a hardware store. Um, anticipating supply chain disruptions is an interesting macro application, because you can look at where are their port slowdowns? Where are their ships that are getting stuck in the ports? Where are their slowdowns on the roads? And you can even actually track, to some extent, your suppliers. So look at the trucks going in and out of the distribution centers for your major suppliers and see cases they may not have shared with you yet where there may be supply disruptions that will then impact the supply chain further down and impact the retail. Because the world, as you know, is a very connected place. And that's um, part of the attraction of this, the ability to look at the whole world, understand trends and, t and, and tendencies across the whole world, and where that's going in terms of logistics, in terms of supply chain, as well as in terms of where you could be expanding. So thank you very much. That should give you some idea where this is going. And who are your customers, James, apart from the hedge funds on Wall Street? So um, we're working in multiple verticals. So we're, we do a lot of business with governments. Um, we do business with, with folks on Wall Street. We do some business talking with retailers, insurance companies, energy. Interesting thing about understanding the world, lots of people need to do it to do their jobs. Lots of people need to understand the world to do their jobs. 
And is satellite imagery the best way of getting this real-time data? I met a company on the weekend called Terralytics that's using mobile phone anonymized data so you can see yeah. where human beings are moving mm -hmm. through the city. Yeah, ultimately, we see this as understanding the world as a geospatial problem. So, so we don't really care whether we're dealing with an image which is of pixels of light and dark or whether we're dealing with an image which is how many cell phone counts there are in each quadrant. Right? So I think ultimately there's a really nice synergy between car counts, cell phone counts, um, and other kinds of data, car counts from connected cars. So I think in the, as time goes on, the Internet of Things actually gives us a whole host of geospatial signals that can be analyzed at scale to understand socioeconomic trends. So essentially you're an AI company that's taking any of these kinds of data points and trying to understand what they mean. Right, anything that can go on a map we want to analyze that and figure out what, what's going on with it and what it means for us. Well, when you've had your drones and satellites above London after a couple of hours, do come back and let us know what you've discovered. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Thank you very much, Thank James, for Orbital Insight. Thanks. Thanks.